long as we can look back, it's thrown in its lot with us. Marijuana has been associated with human camps as far back into the Paleolithic age as we can look. And that's very interesting. That plant, its destiny and human destiny are very intertwined. And there are a few plants in the world that have been as useful to human beings. It provides an edible seed, uh, an edible oil that can be pressed out of the seed, a, a very important fiber in uh, world commerce, a medicine which has been very prominent in Europe and uh, America over the years, and finally a psychoactive drug that's used as a recreational drug by millions of people. That's a, that's a pretty powerful way for one plant to provide for human needs. But in modern times, to merely be in the presence of this plant is a criminal offence. Millions have been and continue to be arrested. The longest and strongest fibre in the plant kingdom, cannabis sativa, commonly called hemp, has been essential to world commerce for thousands of years. Before the mid-1800s, most ships were rigged with hemp rope and hemp sails. A 44-gun warship, like America's old Ironsides, took over 60 tonnes of hemp rigging, including an anchor cable over two feet in circumference. Also, the oakum that sealed the ship's boards and the sailors' clothing were made of hemp as were the uniforms of soldiers and flags. The wagons of pioneer days were covered in hemp canvas. In fact, the word canvas comes from the word cannabis, which is found in ancient Sumerian and Babylonian languages 6,000 years ago. America's founding fathers, including George Washington, were keen growers of hemp, and Thomas Jefferson was probably the first hemp activist. Realising hemp's value to the prosperity and defence of the nation, he encouraged farmers to grow hemp instead of tobacco. Today's activists rally in the thousands at annual hemp harvest festivals throughout the Western world. They make some pretty big and enthusiastic claims. Hemp could totally replace trees as far as making paper, all paper, from fine stationery to press board, build houses from it. We could stop cutting down trees the day hemp's made legal for paper. It can replace all petroleum as far as fuel, electricity, nuclear energy. How about a hemp hemp array? Hemp hemp! Hemp hemp! Hemp hemp! All right, all right, let's make a buck out there. Of course it's possible that some of these activists might have an ulterior motive. But nevertheless, their claims warrant further investigation. Hemp has been the major paper-making material for most of the time since paper was discovered in China around the time of Christ. This first paper ever to be printed on in about AD 770 is 100% hemp. By the 16th century, hemp was the material of choice for European paper makers. They made it into the finest and longest lasting paper ever made, including the Gutenberg and King James Bibles and many other famous works. America's Declaration of Independence was also first printed on hemp paper. Most paper of this period was made from recycled hemp canvas and old rags made from various fibres. For hundreds of millions of us today, paper is a way of life. The world consumes hundreds of thousands of tonnes of paper each year, and to meet this demand, hundreds of thousands of acres of forest are cut down each year. It's a worldwide crisis. In southeastern Australia, vast areas of old-growth forests are being chipped and bought by Japanese companies like Harris Dye Shower. Eugene Collins is a forester turned activist. Most of these forests take in the vicinity of 150 years to uh, mature and to, to provide habitat for all the uh, arboreals that require the hollows and things like that in them. This, this operation will be operating on uh, about somewhere between 40 and 80 years, which is about half of what it takes to, for these uh, forests to regenerate to their full maturity. 
This is basically a resource grab by an industry that's in trouble. The whole operation is a biological disaster and should be stopped immediately. There's no need to be flattening these forests. We could be doing it with, other, with alternative fibres. Hemp and uh, Kanaf are just two of them. Mommy, mommy, tell me about the trees And tell me again about those fish that swam the seas And why aren't they here for you and me? Why can't we live in harmony? John Stahl runs a hand paper making and printing business in Northern California. He has found that hemp stalks produce the best fine quality art paper. Wood pulp is used for paper making not because it's suitable, simply because it's cheap and it's a byproduct of uh, the whole logging industry. But the uh, available cellulose is something like 30%. It's really not very good and it has to be um, processed with all kinds of toxic chemicals. Since the invention of the wood paper process around the turn of the century, paper quality has deteriorated, and so has the environment. The water that comes out of the pulp plant, out of the pulp process, has large quantities of chemicals that are potentially toxic to marine organisms that live in the bay. Those chemicals include dioxins, they include chloroform, and a whole suite of other chlorinated organic compounds. Over 2,000 have been identified. Hemp, on the other hand, is, is somewhere in, in, around 77% cellulose and very few impurities, and it really is an ideal material for paper making. Realising the problems associated with wood pulp paper, the Dutch government has launched a major research project involving eight different research institutes to study hemp's potential as a fibre crop for paper and other uses. I hope that this um, research will finally uh, produce uh, a process where we can use uh, uh, hemp to make uh, fibers that can be used for paper and probably also other products in such a way that we will have a complete uh, clean process and an energy efficient uh, process that causes very little uh, pollution and that also will prevent yeah, the cutting down of trees uh, somewhere else in the world. Hemp is one crop that looks promising because it is a it is a plant that is pretty resistant to a lot of diseases and it grows well in the Netherlands. It can be uh, used without using pesticides and it doesn't need very special requirements with respect to soil nutrients. It needs some fertilizer but not uh, that much. Normally uh, hemp grows the best in some warmer climates than the type of climate that we have in the Netherlands but even in the Netherlands hemp is growing pretty fast. The Dutch are proud of their perfect crop, three to four meters in height. Commercial hemp is also well established in France, where they have licensed farmers to grow strains that are almost drug free. Cultivation for the purpose of paper making really began around 1960. So now there are between 3,000 and 10,000 hectares. It is used to make special paper and, in particular, cigarette paper. In order to make this kind of paper, you need textile fibres that are very resilient. Hemp is one of the few plants in the world that contains fibres of a very high quality. The United Kingdom licensed commercial hemp in 1993 and is already producing a variety of hemp products, including this fine writing paper. In Australia, the Tasmanian government has allowed this experimental non-drug strain crop at the instigation of Patsy Harmson. In Australia, we'd be very silly to let 
a crop like hemp go because it could solve a lot of our problems. One of our major problems is soil degradation. And just like in the old days when hemp was used to repair land after soil erosion, it could just as easily be used these days for repairing our own soil. It's a natural weed suppressant because of the way it grows. It grows on these tall, skinny stalks for good fibre, just with a thick canopy of leaves up above, and that just um, prevents anything underneath from being able to grow. The other beautiful thing about hemp is its long taproot, and the taproot binds the soil together. The nutrients in the hemp plant are concentrated in both the roots and the leaves and the flower head. And because if you're growing it for fibre, you're only removing the stalk, the roots stay in the ground and the leaves and the flower heads are returned to the soil, which means that you're returning most of your nutrients. You're only removing cellulose and water if you're growing it for paper or textiles. Here in Australia, we're virtually giving away our native forests at a price of, say, $70 to $80 a tonne. Hemp, on the other hand, could be a wonderful replacement and would fetch $400 at least a tonne. Jim Young is one of the few voices in the US paper industry calling for change. He's the executive editor of Pulp and Paper magazine. North America obviously has been blessed with uh, an abundance of uh, wood fibre, but the the situation is changing now. We're coming to the end of the line on, on the virgin timber, and it's time to look at other sources of fiber to, the, to be used in the pulp and paper process here. And hemp is certainly one that should be considered for that uh, use in future uh, operations of our pulp and paper mills. The federal government has uh, recognized the need for finding alternatives for, uh, to wood pulp because uh, we're running out of trees. Way back in 1916, they published Bulletin 404 from the United States Department of Agriculture, suggesting hemp as an alternative for wood pulp. They discovered that an acre of hemp would yield four times as much pulp as a wood fiber on a sustained yield basis. Not only that, the hemp can be grown anywhere. It grows like a weed so that you could very easily supply the pulp mills with hemp and save the few trees that do remain to us for timber. The textile industry is also experiencing a resurgence of interest in hemp. The beauty of the hemp fibre is that it could be many things uh, depending on its method of cultivation and the method of processing. These can range from coarse um, hessians, industrial fabrics such as carpet backings, to the finest linens. With special steam treatment, uh, the fibre can fibrillate and produce a cloth of a silky consistency which is indistinguishable from, uh, from natural silk. Uh, it's limited only by your imagination and the technology that's uh, been developed over hundreds of years. The fabrics that we're producing at the moment utilises either pure hemp or a blend of hemp and cotton. The jacket, for instance, that I'm wearing at the moment, 100% uh, 11 ounce hemp linen, it has all the characteristics and uh, appeal of a natural linen. Hemp is undoubtedly the most durable of the natural fibres. The original Levi jeans were made from recycled sailcloth, which was made from hemp fibre, and uh, it, it proved its worth under the most trying of conditions. Uh, the testing we've done over three years, uh, three years of very hard wash and wear, don't make the slightest impression on the hemp fibre. It softens, but it doesn't weaken. In terms of yield per acre, hemp probably outproduces cotton by at least 200% and uh, perhaps more under ideal conditions. Unlike cotton, uh, hemp can be grown entirely without uh, pesticides or insecticides.
The cotton industry is basically a chemical industry. It's highly dependent on the use of pesticides at all stages of production, right from the drilling of the seed through to the harvesting. That's pollution of air, water and soil, and eventually people. Cotton is the fourth largest export earner, foreign exchange earner in Australia. It's the heaviest user of pesticides of any rural industry. The cotton industry's got to change and there's got to be alternatives. You've got to have different sorts of crop rotations, use of various sorts of other fibre crops, etc. So we do have this really, really big environmental problem that they don't want to recognise because of the business implications. The technology is different for processing hemp, so obviously it would cost quite a lot to set up your hemp textile technology. But when you consider how easy it is to grow, how inexpensive it is to grow because you don't have to pour money into chemicals and you don't have to do a whole lot of repair work on humans that are getting sick from being in amongst the pesticides. When you consider all of those hidden costs, or pretty glaring costs actually, um, it's certainly going to be a far more beneficial crop, probably even in the short term. Prior to 1937, 70 to 90 per cent of all rope, twine and cordage was made from hemp. Hemp's strong fibres can also be utilised in hundreds of composite products. Henry Ford used hemp and other natural fibres to make the body of this car in 1941. William Condy has a redwood lumber business in Oregon. In the face of dwindling redwood supplies, his company has taken some bold steps to solve the problem. We talk about advanced composites from annual fibers is the way to solve the forest crisis. Trees are fiber. That's what we cut them down for. But you take a Douglas fir tree, the longest fiber was three quarters of an inch. Well, here's hemp. And this stuff is like, instead of partials of an inch, this is like feet long. When you're making composites, there's a rule that says that if everything else is equal, the longer the fiber, the stronger the product. The truth of the matter is, is that hemp is a superior fiber to tree fiber in every way conceivable. What we created here is we created uh, what's called medium density fiber board in all of the major strength tests. Hemp tested out to be two to three times stronger than the boards that were made out of tree fiber. We can actually make anything from a two by four to uh, the body for a stealth jet bomber. George Tyson is also an innovative hemp researcher. The food industry is looking for a water soluble, biodegradable materials that they will be able to make food containers with in the future because their primary concern is to take away the materials that formerly found themselves going into landfills and making material that will fully biodegrade or recycle. We certainly believe we could package hamburgers. The trays may look something like this. If these products were tossed out or ground up and spread on the landscape, they would be nature's fertilizers. There would be no toxic effect. This could lead to fast food places serving you the food in a container of a flavor of your choice, strawberry, mint, or chocolate, and then you eat the container as your dessert. We envision hemp as being a complete new wave of the Industrial Revolution. That there'll be a complete new industry that will come out of this. Actually, there'll be thousands of products that can be derived from this fiber and from the oils of the seed. Hemp seeds contain up to 40% high quality oil, a combustible oil that has traditionally been used in lanterns. A simple process now allows it to be converted into a relatively clean substitute for diesel fuel. In past centuries, hempseed oil was also a major base for durable, non-toxic paints. Many great paintings are hemp oil on hemp canvas. In the Ukraine today, hempseed oil is still a major ingredient in the commercial paint industry. It is a nutritious base for cosmetics and is also a highly nutritious edible oil. Hempseed oil is unique in having such a high proportion of the omega-3 uh, unsaturated fatty acids. 
uh, with a very strong cardioprotective effect. Hemp seed has been used for millennium as a, uh, a staple food by many people around the world. It has a near complete balance of essential amino acids, second only to soybean. Well aware of this, Alan Brady is one of the few modern hemp seed chefs. Once it's in this form, it's all roasted and ground up, you can get creative and you can make a million things. You know, it's like I make halava. If you want to make something where um, any kind of bread recipe, pancakes, anything, just leave out half your amount of flour and replace it with this stuff right here. Get totally creative, make delicious things and have fun with it. After dehulling the seed, Alan produces his premium delicacy, rich and creamy hemp ice cream. Hemp is probably the world's most economical, ecological and easy way to grow protein. And there is no need to worry, hemp seeds are totally drug free. If you know a way to save the planet, don't whisper about it, shout about it. We are uh, hemp revolutionaries and to present ourselves uh, directly as a hemp revolutionary it is quite difficult to hear. Hemp's prohibition in Nepal led to a massive police eradication campaign in the early 90s but now only two years later the valley of Tarakola is unified to defend its traditional hemp industries primarily rope and seeds. <laughs> As this region is too high and dry to grow rice, the people depend upon hemp seeds for their survival. Since 1992, the human union movement is developing a commercial hemp paper, textile and oil industry. A chemical free industry providing much needed employment and income. They do not have to make hashes out of their plant because they can sell the stocks, they can sell the seed, they can have food and they can have money from one plant. So the people and the farmer of this surrounding are really appreciating our project here. <laughs> this valley has an abundance of hemp and enthusiastic labour. Tarakola's budding hemp industry is potentially a model for sustainable economic prosperity throughout the developing world. Hemp could be used as a fuel source, an oil source, uh, as, as well as a paper making fiber. Could hemp fuel help us to kick out a dependency on highly toxic fossil fuels? Carbon monoxide is the leading cause of death in this country from poisoning. It accounts for more fatalities each year than all drug overdoses combined. Over history, it would be hard to predict how many people have died from gasoline that didn't know that what killed them. It is a poison spreading material because it is distilled with benzene, hexene and xylene and toline. These chemicals are all known carcinogenic materials. Could this be the solution? That which fuels a romantic dinner is also a good fuel. Normal drinking alcohol, also known as ethanol, is the cleanest of all liquid fuels. George Tyson is developing techniques to produce ethanol from fast-growing high cellulose plants like hemp. Uh, we jokingly say this is the fuel that if you were burning it in your car, the reason a dog would chase your car was because he liked to smell of the exhaust pipe. 
As you can see, there is no smoke emitting from this in this room. Try this with a tablespoon or two of gasoline and you will have the comparative test. Also, when your engine is through burning on gasoline, take it apart and see how, how much dirty carbon you find in the engine. We found that running a car 3,500 miles, we couldn't even get a white glove dirty when we took our finger inside of the exhaust pipe. All plants are storehouses of solar energy, and all plants can be fermented to produce ethanol fuel. Plants also produce the oxygen needed to combust the fuel in a car. The emissions, carbon dioxide and water, are reabsorbed by plants. It is a clean and balanced cycle. When one reviews all of the possible alternative fuels that we may use for, for transport use, uh, ethanol emerges as about the only one that can achieve significant reductions in carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere. Even the 10% blend where you only have 10% ethanol in, uh, in the gasoline lowers uh, some emissions as much as 25 to 30 percent. For this reason, blends of 10 or 15 percent ethanol with gasoline are being used in several states in the US and in Australia as a means of reducing air pollution. Ethanol blends also eliminate the need for lead in fuel. The ethanol is being distilled from sugarcane, grains or residue starch as is the case with this ethanol plant in Nara, Australia. Ethanol produced here is also being added to diesel fuel. Buses running on this new 15% ethanol fuel are emitting up to 40% less carbon monoxide, 50% less smoke, and up to 10% less nitrous oxide than straight diesel fuel. In the context of ethanol making a significant contribution to transport fuel needs, we need to think about producing ethanol from cellulose or more uh, correctly, lignocellulosic feedstocks. All plants are made from lignin and cellulose. Fast-growing plants that are low in lignin and high in cellulose are most suitable for producing ethanol. Things like switchgrass, uh, canaf, uh, hemp has tremendous potential, uh, uh, both because it has many, many products to be produced from it, and also because of the tonnage it can be produced per acre. Ethanol from lignocellulose crops is being developed by Tyson Xylan Corporation and the Solar Energy Research Institute in the US and Apace Research and the University of New South Wales in Australia. Research is showing that ethanol could be produced economically on a small farm or community level. It could also become one of the world's major agro-industries, replacing the petroleum industry entirely. It's estimated that, that by the year 2000, uh, we will have demonstrated processes and technologies for the production of ethanol from cellulosics that will make, will be able to produce ethanol at a price competitive with crude oil prices. Even the United States could produce all of its transport fuel needs as neat ethanol. Australia, no problem. All of our liquid fuel for transport could be ethanol. These days, the hemp plant is most commonly associated with the drug marijuana found in its flowers and leaves. Historically, however, marijuana has been much more than a recreational drug. The father of Chinese medicine, Emperor Shen Nung, included marijuana in his pharmacopoeia almost 5,000 years ago. Recently, marijuana was found in a 1,600-year-old skeleton of a woman giving birth near Jerusalem. Medical literature of the time indicates that marijuana had the power to increase the force of uterine contractions and to provide a significant reduction of labour pain. 
References to marijuana are also recorded in Egyptian, Assyrian, Greek and Roman writing from the same era. On the Indian subcontinent, marijuana is found in many preparations in ancient Ayurvedic medicine and is still widely used today. In the last century, marijuana was mainly used in tincture form as a treatment for migraine headaches, for menstrual cramps, for nervous anxiety, as a sedative. Dr. Lester Grinspoon is the world's foremost researcher and author on medical marijuana. Now, the modern uses of cannabis are quite striking. Uh, first of all, it's um, people who have to get cancer chemotherapies for the treatment of various kinds of cancer. Some of them lead to uh, the most pernicious nausea and vomiting. And there are drugs which are used, to, uh, available antiemetic drugs. But even the newest ones don't give everybody relief from this. Give them cannabis, about 90% of them get excellent relief. They refer to it as miraculous. It's used in the treatment of glaucoma. It's a disease of the increase in intraocular pressure and it can lead to blindness. Well, there are drugs to treat this, but those drugs have a lot of uh, problems with them. My condition is glaucoma, and uh, after a year of trying the conventional medications, which are very serious, some of them are actually based on nerve gas, and my body did not respond well to them, a doctor decided to uphold his Hippocratic Oath instead of the Hippocritical Law and tell me that if I didn't start using marijuana, I would go blind. It's been demonstrated that uh, the cannabis uh, has a remarkable capacity to lower intraocular pressure. And uh, there are people now who believe that they have saved their eyesight by using uh, cannabis. As long as I use marijuana in any, in any way, such as eating it or smoking it, either way, my pressures remain perfectly normal as if I don't have the disease at all. It's a total deterrent for me. Cannabis has also been proven to be of therapeutic value in the treatment of AIDS, multiple sclerosis, paraplegia and quadriplegia, asthma, epilepsy, pain relief and other ailments. It has also been used as a topical antibiotic and analgesic. Dr Andrew Weil was the first and about the only independent researcher to ever get permission to study marijuana. He carried out his lab experiments at Harvard University Medical School in 1968. He is also a well-known author. I think the great advantage to trying to find medical uses of marijuana is that it's so non-toxic. You know, relative to most of the drugs that we use in medicine today, it's, a, it's very harmless. It just doesn't do that much to the physical body. But marijuana remains one of the most illegal substances on the planet. In US law, it is placed in the most dangerous category, Schedule 1. It's in that schedule that uh, drugs like uh, LSD, heroin, and marijuana are placed. And drugs that are in that schedule can't be used at all. They are completely off limits. You can't even do any clinical research. For the last 19 years, all efforts to pry cannabis out of Schedule 1 and just move it to Schedule 2 have failed. In 1972, the US Drug Enforcement Administration's senior judge, Judge Francis Young, commenced hearings on marijuana. He came up with a 60-odd page opinion saying marijuana is probably the safest drug in the pharmacopoeia, and it certainly has medical utility, and it should be moved to Schedule Two. It's quite extraordinary just how steadfast the U.S. government has been in not allowing this to be used as a medicine. My hunch is that uh, there's some kind of fear that if we use it as a medicine, the camel will get its nose under the tent, and heavens only knows what might happen. As Judge Francis Young said, it's unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious, and I add immoral to that list. It's become so expensive on the street now that frequently these people who need it for medicinal reasons grow it, and they get caught. I was arrested and taken to a county jail, which was pretty unpleasant for the illegal rape, as I call it. I tried it, and I was able to actually cook a meal and eat it. And ever since then, we've been, we smoked it for two years, and then that's when we got arrested. Twelve agents from the local vice squad played Miami Vice, uh, shattered their front door, put guns to their heads, drug them off to jail. I didn't have no shoes because they didn't let me, you know, put my shoes on. So I went to jail barefooted. 
That was my worst nightmare that I've ever had. It's just awful that these people should have to uh, uh, suffer this way. I mean, the law imposes, here are people who are already suffering from serious diseases and disorders and symptoms, and the law is now imposing another layer of anxiety on these poor people. American pharmaceutical establishment and government have been very reluctant to allow people to use marijuana for these purposes because to do so would be to admit that it had positive uses. And one of the fictions that has to be maintained in the war against this evil plant is that it has no redeeming qualities. And if you established a therapeutic use for it, that would be a redeeming quality. So instead, the government wants people to use synthetic THC or analogs of THC. In my experience, it, those substances are more toxic and often do not have as good effects as marijuana itself. THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, is the active ingredient in marijuana. Ironically, synthetic THC, marketed as Marinol, is legally available for medical use. Doctors, pharmacists, uh, pharmaceutical companies are very threatened by the idea of people having direct access to substances that really work. And so there is a lot of uh, effort to scare people away from natural medicines by telling them that they're dangerous, that things out of nature are more dangerous for you than the products of pharmaceutical companies. And I think that's, that, is, that is not a good thing to tell people. In my experience, natural medicines are much, much safer than synthetic and refined ones. This realization is spreading. In 1991, Dennis Perron launched a San Francisco citywide referendum for medical marijuana. Proposition P won by a landslide. This preceded similar victories in several other US cities and the California statewide initiative of 1996. Now in downtown San Francisco, the Brownie Mary Rathburn building is home to the Cannabis Buyers Club that serves marijuana to 10,000 patients. Attempts by the federal DEA to close down the building and arrest Perron and his staff have been firmly blocked by the San Francisco city authorities. Two million people are infected with the HIV virus. Half a million people get cancer every year. These people are our brothers and our sisters, our relatives, our aunts and uncles, people we love. I don't think that any of these people, any of these relatives, would stand in the way of their brothers and sisters getting a medicine that would help them. Unfortunately, modern usage of the hemp plant centers around only one of its many uses, its ability to alter consciousness. Like the other uses, this is also not a recent phenomenon. The oldest domesticated plants are the drug plants. We have historical evidence that they were domesticated by people before food crops. In various cultures throughout history, marijuana has been used, valued, because it was a doorway to other states of consciousness. It's a blessed, blessed plant. It's a blessed plant. It can give you a little happiness. Marijuana has been an important religious sacrament throughout Africa, the Middle East, and Asia for thousands of years. In Hinduism, the god Shiva is said to have brought cannabis from the Himalayas for human enjoyment and enlightenment.
Why then is marijuana use so controversial in Western culture? Marijuana cultivation and use in Europe probably was mainly as a fiber plant and food plant. And it's very possible that many people who grew it for fiber and for seeds did not know of its use as a psychoactive drug. Terence McKenna is a leading researcher and author on the traditional uses of psychoactive plants. The absence of a straightforward hallucinogen or psychedelic in the flora of Europe has given Western man a kind of particular horror of the kind of boundary dissolving experiences that attend these plants. Another factor is the Christian church. The reliance of magical folk practitioners on plants was consistently suppressed by the church. So we have evolved our peculiarly alienated form of science and uh, social polity completely in the absence of any connection back into the magical side of nature that Celtic and earlier peoples were very concerned to cultivate. So this, I think, is the source of our particularly destructive relationship to the earth and our particularly alienated state of social relationships among ourselves. Only a hundred years has Western humanity and civilization actually grappled with the dilemmas which these substances pose. So we're at the beginning of making an adjustment which many traditional societies made a comfortable accommodation to millennia ago. Our beginning to make an adjustment has been a rough one. Our nation has zero tolerance for casual drug use. When I was in England, I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it, and didn't inhale, and never tried it again. If you do drugs, you will be caught. And when you're caught, you will be punished. One of the major concerns is drug use among young people. I think marijuana can, can make kids space out and lose their concentration, and I think the only uh, remedy for that is good drug education especially aimed at young people, about what are appropriate uses of it and what aren't. And I don't think it's a good idea to be stoned in school, for example. Um, but we don't have any real drug education at the moment, because in the present climate, that's impossible. You can't admit that illegal drugs have any positive uses. And all of the educational materials that are used in schools are designed to scare people away from that substance by exaggerating its dangers, and that doesn't work. If you tell a 15-year-old that all these terrible things are going to happen to him or her when they smoke marijuana, and they've already tried it, and they know that it didn't, why should they listen to you when you tell them that crack cocaine might kill them? I wouldn't have if I was 15 and was misinformed like that. I think that kind of education has a very negative effect. I think it enormously stimulates curiosity on the part of young people to try the forbidden substance. Now, I can imagine a few whispers out there. Maybe you think we'll never get drugs under control, that it's too easy for the dealers to get back on the street. Well, those days are over, too. The revolving door just jammed. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make room. We're almost doubling prison space. Some think there aren't enough prosecutors. We'll hire them, with the largest increase in federal prosecutors in history. America is now the country with the highest rate of incarceration. Approximately 20% of criminal convictions are marijuana-related. There is no inherent psychopharmacological harmfulness of marijuana which is any way comparable to the harm of arresting more than 400,000 people, mostly young people, for marijuana transgressions every year in this country. We will look back on this era and the response to drugs in this country and think that was worse than what happened in the McCarthy era. It is insanity run amok, and there's not a sane voice in the federal government saying anything about it. All this vigorous prosecution of marijuana, for example, has changed a situation where people grew their own, and usually rather mild marijuana, into a situation where marijuana traffic is dominated by organized crime. The cash crop in California that is the most profitable is marijuana in California. A number of other states also depend heavily upon the production of marijuana. In addition to that, you have the profits made by banks, 
through laundering money. What we are doing in the war on drugs is exactly what the most successful drug kingpins like. We are, in a sense, using government money to keep the small-time opposition out of the business, to keep the prices up and to uh, keep the supply coming from only the most protected uh, sources. Prohibition breeds corruption and breeds, breeds a black market. And we've seen in Australia quite a large number of police officers who have been charged in relation to the supplying of marijuana, and that's the corruption element that's inbred. Lawrence McKinney holds the patent for extracting natural THC from marijuana plants for medical use, but the war on drugs has prevented him from using his patent. The major advantages of the drug war to the Justice Department is that the RICO statutes allow them to confiscate and sell anything they can find that's connected to any person who has any uh, large amounts of marijuana. And the result has been such amount of money, over a billion dollars last year, that these drug laws are simply phenomenally profitable to the Justice Department. Fighting a war on drugs is big business now. It is strictly to encourage this um, society of people who can't imagine themselves in another job other than fighting a war. And when they run out of wars outside of the country, then we're implementing our own military on our own people. And it's just gotten totally, totally out of hand. Law enforcement, whether they are military or not, constantly try to take on more and more of the appearance of military. And it's a psychological tactic as much as anything else. When this happens to someone, the helicopters will come down and they'll hover and they'll direct troops or there'll be troops traipsing in the woods near your house and your animals will get frightened and your babies will get frightened and you'll get frightened, regardless of whether you're involved in anything illegal. When the walls have begun to crumble, when the laws have begun to burn, when the wind is singing freedom, when the stone begins to turn, when the wind is singing freedom, 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 freedom. You have vast amounts of money internationally spent to force other countries to go after their marijuana. Nepal is one of the last countries in the world that had a controlled marijuana uh, marketplace, you might say, that was well controlled by the government. Now, because of the pressure from the United States, they made it illegal. With marijuana suddenly illegal, the trafficking was taken over by criminals. And these criminal smugglers very rapidly began to discover there were things that were more valuable than marijuana to smuggle and infected Nepal and that whole area with you know, heroin smuggling and worse. So it shows you an example of how just with a, a few dollars and a little bit of pressure, the United States can take a regulated, non-harmful situation and turn it into a situation of crimes, victims, money, and extortion and death. The repression of Lebanon's ancient hemp industry occurred recently during the Gulf War at the behest of the US government and Syria's President Assad. Now, we are friends with Assad, and the United States is backing his efforts to wipe out marijuana growers in Lebanon with tanks. That's what we do with our marijuana policies uh, worldwide. The United States drug policy in, in, in toto affects every country. Eddie Engelsman is head of drug policy for the Dutch government. We think that cannabis use is hazardous. We have a very, I must say, comprehensive anti-smoking policy. But does this harm or this, this risk of getting any harm justify such draconic measures? We think, no, at least our policy should do, shouldn't do more harm than such a drug would do. Every major government study ever publicly funded that studied hemp has come to the conclusion that criminalizing it is a bad methodology. Richard Nixon wanted to really drive the stake through the heart of marijuana, so he appointed a 21-member committee. The Schaefer Commission recommended that marijuana be decriminalized. Nixon just denied the results, rolled right over them. The recent U.S. study, commissioned by conservative California Governor Duke Majin, recommended that adults be allowed to grow marijuana plants for personal use. The embarrassed governor refused to endorse it. It's a similar story in Australia. 
since 1970, there have been up to 12 inquiries or royal commissions or parliamentary inquiries into the uh, drug marijuana. And all of those inquiries have recommended decriminalisation. And yet no government has been prepared to uh, stand up and say, well, the inquiries have recommended decriminalisation. We will act on the recommendations of the inquiries. All the surveys show that over 50% of the community accept the use of marijuana. And if that is so, then what you're doing is getting a law that um, is enforcing something that the community doesn't necessarily want enforced. In Holland, the direct problem, the issue, is considered a, an issue of health and welfare. So it's not uh, for the police and the courts. One objective of our cannabis policy, if I may say so, not prosecute people. It is illegal, but to a certain extent tolerated, which has nothing to do with a laissez-faire approach, but we didn't want to push people in the ground. The sale of marijuana is tolerated in many Dutch coffee shops. Nowadays, cannabis users have nothing to do with users using harder drugs. We have integrated uh, education on cannabis in our general health education system in schools. In America, cannabis use is, is, is many times higher than it is in, in Holland. In spite of all the, uh, 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 all the measures and all their wars and all their warning and just say no campaigns. So what is the attraction to marijuana? It does carry a fantasy-inducing, thought-catalyzing quality. It allows the mind to rove and scan in a, more, a much more uh, expansive domain of information than is normally the case. I mean, if you don't smoke cannabis, you may spend your evening balancing your check account. If you do smoke cannabis, you may spend your evening contemplating the causes of the Greek Renaissance. It's a perceptual enhancer. It's like a child seeing something for the first time. There's a little bit of that excitement about the visual world. It enhances the appreciation of music and the graphic arts. I have met many people who I think have experienced uh, uh, increased in imagination and creativity uh, from experimenting with marijuana, uh, who have discovered themselves as uh, physical, sensual, sexual beings on marijuana who otherwise had not developed that part of themselves. They find that it's useful in, in uh, gaining perspective and, uh, and insight in their lives. Marijuana creates a receptive, suggestible state which could facilitate certain kinds of therapy. It often uh, increases people's access to their, uh, to their own unconscious, to the images that they have in their mind, to their dreams, to uh, uh, feelings which they other might not be, be aware of. So I think it could be in the right hands an aid to therapy. Not everybody uh, uh, is capable of using cannabis in this way, but it can be used in this way by people who, who make an effort to learn to use it in this way. Obviously, Western society fails to offer guidance on how to use marijuana beneficially. I've seen many people who use marijuana addictively, of many people who use it all the time, and I think get very little effect out of it. I see people who smoke it and get groggy and doped out. The real problem is that people do too much. They don't understand that the best way to do cannabis is approximately once a week. The desire to have altered states of consciousness is basically healthy and normal. 
it can have bad expressions. And I think in our culture where there is no recognition of that desire and we don't teach young people how to satisfy it in healthy ways, it's obvious that we're going to see a lot of negative expressions of it. More money has been spent trying to find something wrong with cannabis than any other vegetable material in human history. And what they've come up with is so pathetically thin that I am confident that uh, uh, it amounts to a clean bill of health for this stuff. US government health authorities estimate that there are about 350,000 deaths per year caused by tobacco and around 125,000 from alcohol. This does not include alcohol's involvement in 50% of all road fatalities and 65% of all murders. There are 14 to 27,000 deaths from legal medicines and over a thousand of these have been recorded as overdoses of aspirin. There are around 5,000 deaths from illegal drugs while ailments related to caffeine kill up to 10,000 people per year. But there have been no deaths attributed to marijuana. Cannabis is not a health problem. The problem is that it promotes social values and attitudes which are unwelcome in capitalist market-based society. It's just that simple. A drug like coffee with a horrendous health profile compared to cannabis is completely welcomed into the marketplace and the home and the lifestyle of, uh, of modern people. This is simply that we value certain states of mind and we fear and suspect others. And this is based entirely on value systems that are inculcated uh, from above. Clearly, the discussion as to how society should deal with marijuana is likely to continue for some time. But is marijuana the reason hemp is no longer the major industry it once was? After all, the industrial-grade hemp crop is virtually free of THC. Hemp historian Gatewood Galbraith speaks from his home state of Kentucky. There are 14 of these historical markers around the central Kentucky commemorating hemp as a cash crop in the state. It's pretty self-explanatory. We were the world's largest producer for over 100 years. How did hemp go from being a major crop to almost non-existence in a span of around 50 years? Historical research conducted by our company suggests that it was the discovery of an efficient hemp decorticating machine and the promised resurgence of hemp to industry that led to the imposition of legal sanctions in the United States and the demise of the hemp industry. In the early 1930s, the American hemp industry remained highly labour-intensive long after competing industries had mechanised. Furthermore, other fibres like manila hemp had begun to be imported from underdeveloped countries where labour was dirt cheap. By 1930, the hemp industry bottomed out at a thousand acres. But hemp technology finally caught up, and the crop expanded to 14,000 acres in the next seven years. Hemp was poised to become the new billion-dollar crop as reported in popular mechanics and mechanical engineering magazines written in early 1938. A factory in Illinois had begun producing fine bond paper from hemp fibre. Hemp with its high cellulose content could also now be made into, quote, more than 25,000 products ranging from dynamite to cellophane and all manner of plastics. But in the mid-30s, DuPont Chemicals patented processes to make nylon and plastics from oil and coal. A resurgence of the hemp industry would seriously have threatened the emerging petrochemical industries with their synthetic fibre nylon being uh, invented in 1935. Hearst uh, was a, a big printer uh, back during the uh, 20s and 30s and he uh, had vast interest in timberland uh, for paper pulp which could be used as a result of a chemically intensive paper pulp process developed by DuPont and patented by DuPont. They made their fortunes with these chemical shipments for the paper pulp industry, and hemp represented a less chemically intensive way of manufacturing a higher grade paper. Consequently, DuPont saw it as an uh, economic competitor. William Randolph Hearst, uh, the owner of the largest newspaper chain in the United States between the world wars, started publishing newspaper articles linking cannabis with violent crime. They renamed the plant marijuana to dissociate it from the hemp 
medicines, the hemp rope and fabric that Americans had been using profitably for generations. Many stories in his papers told of blacks or Mexicans using marijuana and being disrespectful or violent to whites or trying to push their drug to innocent whites. The campaign succeeded in getting racist white organisations to support cannabis prohibition. Hearst and Harry Ainslinger, the then director of the Bureau of Narcotics, managed to get marijuana made illegal in 1937, thus destroying the hemp industries. This timing is interesting. The alcohol prohibition had just ended and the people who had enforced it needed new jobs. This may well be why Ainslinger pushed so hard to get cannabis banned. In Anslinger's words, if the hideous monster Frankenstein came face to face with the monster marijuana, he would drop dead of fright. Reefer Madness was one of the many movies made to whip up an anti-marijuana frenzy. The sale of marijuana is even more difficult to detect and halt than the traffic in drugs such as opium, morphine and heroin. More deadly even than these soul-destroying drugs is the menace of marijuana. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. prohibitionist mentality was ab abhorred by our founding fathers and by Lincoln and by every other great leader in America. They never had the power to prohibit, but they soon gave themselves the power to tax. The, uh, the, law the laws which outlawed marijuana were not prohibitive criminal statutes, they were tax acts, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, where uh, an ounce of marijuana was taxed, taxed at $200, or it was selling on the streets for a dollar. At that time, congressmen voting uh, on this piece of legislation were not aware that marijuana was hemp, cannabis hemp, that that country had been using profitably for centuries. The hemp prohibition was initiated by American petrochemical companies in the 1930s to destroy the economic potential of hemp. It has nothing to do with the chemical effects of cannabis drugs or their perceived danger. It's a blatant case of industrial espionage to remove competition from evolving petrochemical substitutes for superior natural fibres. This was why the prohibition was brought in in 1938 and this is why the prohibition is maintained. Despite hemp being a major fibre crop in America and the world last century, mention of hemp has been erased from museums and textbooks. This display on the history of American textiles in Washington's Smithsonian Institute contains no mention of hemp. When asked why, museum curator Arkado replied, children don't need to know about hemp anymore, it confuses them. Similarly, in the National Textile Museum, there is no mention of hemp, either on display or in the library catalogue. Another example of the hemp cover-up was the attempted destruction of all traces of the US Department of Agriculture's film, Hemp for Victory. This film, made in 1942, was used to encourage patriotic US farmers to grow hemp for the war effort. After 45 years of burial in government archives, it was rediscovered in 1989 by hemp activists. In 1942, 14,000 acres of fiber hemp were harvested in the United States. The goal for 1943 is 300,000 acres. Thus, hemp, cannabis sativa, the old standby cordage fiber, is staging a strong comeback. American hemp will go on duty again. Hemp for mooring ships. Hemp for tow lines. Hemp for tackle and gear. Hemp for countless naval uses, both on ship and shore. Hemp for victory. Straight after the war, however, the government once again abolished the hemp industry and eventually criminalised the plant. A hundred years ago, the farmer produced all of the fibre, 
all of the medicine, all of the fuel, and all of the food that this society consumed. That's what farming is, is you raise those four basic categories, fiber, food, medicine, and fuel, and you sell them in the cities. They're the basic necessities of life. The money flows out of the cities back to the landowner and to the producer, where land is the means of production of wealth. It's been that way for thousands of years. Today, a hundred years later, the farmer doesn't produce any fiber. If they do, it's cotton, which accounts for 50% of the pesticides and herbicides used in the agricultural sector. The farmer doesn't raise any medicine. It's all been monopolized by the pharmaceutical companies. The farmer doesn't raise any fuel. It's all been monopolized by the petrochemical companies. And if you go into a grocery store and look at the ingredients on package, you'll find out how rapidly the farmers are being displaced from their heritage of food production. It's all been taken over by the synthetic manufacturers who, in producing these synthetic products, create the toxic waste and the hazardous byproducts with which we're having such a tough time dealing. And not only that, it concentrates wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people all the time because the means of production of wealth is no longer the land. It is now the factories and the shareholders and the people who own the, uh, the controlling interest uh, in those corporations. government have the right to tell man or woman that they cannot plant a seed in God's green earth and consume the green natural plant that comes up out of it. Uh, that seems such an inalienable right. That seems such a, a natural and basic way of communing with Mother Earth and with the natural cycle of things. It really is only a matter of time before hemp returns to Australian industry and commerce. A lot of preliminary work has been done. Uh, we have literally thousands of hectares ready uh, to be turned over to hemp cultivation. Uh, factories to handle the downstream processing of the fibres are ready and waiting. Uh, the industry can develop very quickly once these foolish bureaucratic limitations are removed. It is just such a simple and benign solution and if we don't do it I think um, we're going to lose just about everything that that we hold dear. Hemp could be and will be the, the greatest economic engine that we have seen probably in the history of the human race. It's the dawn of the natural cycle, and it's here to stay.